I've noticed on several internet forums a lot about how service-grade tube testers are not particularly accurate. This seems completely believable given the wide diversity of tubes that need to be tested, the different price points of the testers, differences in tube testing circuits, and even how different testers have aged since probably none have been made for decades. But I also wonder about the precision that these instruments can offer. In this video, we'll look at the reproducibility of transconductance measurements in vacuum tubes using a Hickok 6000A tube tester. First, some terminology. Usually by accuracy of a measurement, we mean how close a measurement comes to the truth or an accepted value. In the case of vacuum tubes, this is a complex thing. Alan Douglas, in his book on tube testers and classic gear, has really explained this in depth and I recommend reading his book. I don't have anything to add to it, but in this video, we're going to look at precision or reproducibility of a measurement. That is to say, precision is the variation of a measurement about the true value. In the case of the 600A tube tester, there are several user-adjusted settings that must be selected, and these collectively contribute to a final reading. Let's demonstrate. So I've got here on this tube tester a 12AU7A vacuum tube. Uh, the tube tester has been on for several minutes, and uh, I've set up the tube according to the different parameters listed on the roll chart, and so those are all ready to go. So the first thing that we're going to do uh, is we're going to push the line adjust, and we're going to line that up. It actually looks pretty good. Uh, and the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make sure that the English is set so that we can read transconductance and so there's an orange dot you can't see it here well maybe I can lift it up so that you can see it there that orange dot um, and then the bias is set here to 24 all right so these are the three principal measurements so setting the line adjust setting the English and setting the bias everything else is uh, a categorical selection that is to say they're set by these different switches they're either correct or they're not, but the line adjust, the English, and the bias are all somewhat more subjective because they're things that you set according to your vision, which may or may not be very good, uh, which may or may not be straight on, it can suffer parallax effects, uh, and so on and so forth. So let's look at the line adjustment one more time and see if that's changed. That looks pretty good. And then let's push P4 to measure the transconductance. Okay, and that looks like it's about 21, 2, 3, 2150. Okay. Now let me change the line adjustment and move those and then readjust them and see if we get the same reading. So let's bring the line adjustment back into alignment. And I always check it again. So that's pretty good. Okay. And now, let's bring this up here so you can see it. Bring this into adjustment. So that's lined up there. And bring this back to 24. There's 25. 24 is about there. All right. Check the line adjustment one more time. That looks good. Okay. And then the mutual conductance. And in this case, we actually get... 2350 again. So we get the same reading. So the question is, is if I take out of adjustment each one of these things and readjust it to the best of my uh, eyesight, and I do that several times over again, will I always get 2350? Well, let's take a look at that. In order to understand how changes in these adjustments affect the final reading that you get uh, for transconductance on this particular tube tester, I did three experiments. So the first experiment, I set the English and the bias control once, according to the settings on the roll chart. And then I changed the line adjustment over to one side, and I adjusted it so that I ended up aligning it with the test point. I tested it, tested the mutual conductance uh, reading, wrote that measurement down, and then I tested the adjustment, line adjustment one more time to make sure it hadn't changed. And I did this for 20 different measurements. Overall, it took about 15 minutes to do that. For the second experiment, I did the same thing. I adjusted the line control 
and the English, but I kept the bias set at the same place. And I, again, took 20 readings, accepting the ones in which the line adjustment hadn't changed before and after the measurement. And then in the third experiment, I adjusted all three controls. Just to be clear, when I adjusted a control, I set it to one side and then reset it to the reading that it should have been on according to the roll chart. All right, what happened? This is what happened. I recorded a bunch of data, all right, and um, it's probably not clear what those data mean, so I'm not going to talk about the individual figures themselves, but what I am going to do is talk about graphs of the figures. So let's blow this up a little bit so we can see it better. All right, on the vertical axis here, I've got the micro mo reading that we recorded for the first experiment where I only adjusted for each reading the line adjustment. And then this down here is just the, the reading number that I took. So this would be the first data point, this would be the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, and so on. Uh, and the dotted line here is the average of those readings. So when you average those 20 readings, you get 2352 micromos. And the variance, or the variation I should say, between the highest and the lowest data point, the minimum was 2300 micromo, uh, and the maximum was 2375 micromo. Okay, so that's not actually that bad. That's a 75 micromo variation between the highest and the lowest. When you work that out, the standard deviation is just shy of 20 micromo. For the second experiment, plotted here over the first experiment in red, uh, this is where I adjusted both the line adjust and the English for each measurement, but I left the bias set as a constant. First thing you notice is there's a larger variation between the minimum, uh, between the minimum and the maximum measured here. In fact, the minimum was 2325 and the maximum was 2425 micromo. The mean was also higher. Remember the mean before was 2352. This mean is 2375, so it's marginally higher. And so you can see that with the red dotted line. The standard deviation was higher. Remember before it was just about 20, it was slightly under 20. Now it's basically 28 micromo. So when you have two adjustments to make or two adjustments to select. Even when you take your time and you line up the dots with the lines, you see it gives, gives rise to a, a larger variance. And the effect that that had was a higher uh, average transconductance. And then finally, as you might expect for the third experiment, this was where we were changing the line adjust, the English, and the bias controls now. For each measurement, we were selecting them, making the measurement, putting them back to zero, and then reselecting them again and making a new measurement. You see that the variation is higher still. The minimum reading was 2325 like before, but the maximum reading was all the way up at 2450 micromo. This resulted in a higher mean, as you can see with the blue dotted line here, up at 2380 micromo. And the standard deviation, which was before, uh, a little bit lower was what? It was at 28, right? 28.2. Now it's nearly 30. So in this series of measurements, we have a steadily increasing average measurement and a steadily increasing variation or variance spread in the measurements for transconductance of this 12AU7 tube. Well, the reproducibility here will be you know, proportional to the standard deviation, and you see that that goes up as the number of adjustments goes up. What would be kind of neat to do is to try to do the same experiment, but on one of the uh, so-called lab quality tube testers, with which I am not familiar. Um, you know, some of the higher end triplet or uh, Hickok meters, they, those seem to have a similar number of adjustments but I suspect that the dials are much finer and you're able to reproduce 
the same position on the potentiometers and so on and so forth uh, much more accurately and much more reproducibly than on the Hickok 600A. So if any of the viewers out there have any such instruments and want to try to do a similar sort of experiment, I'd love to hear if you get same sort of trends in your data. And if not, you know, maybe someday I'll come across one of these higher precision instruments and we'll be able to tell. Well, I hope you found this interesting. If you did, please give it a big thumbs up below. If you have any comments, I always love to hear those. And as always, thank you for watching.